Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone to please turn off or to silent their electronic devices so they don't affect the committee's work this morning. Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private this morning? Agree. Thank you. Item 2 is the section 22 report, the 2017-18 audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. Leslie Evans, Permanent Secretary. Gordon Wales, Chief Financial Officer. Alison Stafford, Director General, Scottish Exchequer, and David Rogers, Director, Constitution and Cabinet at the Scottish Government. Can I ask, please, the Permanent Secretary to make a brief opening statement? Thank you, Convener. And thank you for the opportunity to provide evidence today on the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts for 2017-18. I'm pleased that the Auditor General's opinion is, for the 13th year, unqualified especially given the significant additional complexity in the government's finances brought about by the Scotland Act 2016. And I'm encouraged that the Scottish Government is recognised for its good record of financial management and reporting. Borrowing, the Scottish Reserve and significant tax raising powers and their associated block grant adjustments for the devolved and assigned taxes are just some of the new features of public spending in Scotland and are unique within the United Kingdom devolved landscape. The journey is not yet complete. Work continues on areas such as the assignment of value-added tax and devolution of air passenger duty. More powers impacting more directly on more people. So we can all expect the picture to grow ever more complex in the years ahead. Given this, it is even more important that the Parliament, and indeed the public, understand how money is raised, how it is spent, and the resulting assets and liabilities. Transparency is critical to that understanding, and the Budget Process Review Group has been helpful in determining <coughs> the approach to scrutiny and defining a new range of publications. These include the first medium-term financial strategy, fiscal framework outturn report, and publications aimed at accessibility, such as Scotland's finances, key facts and figures, which was published alongside the budget. The annual accounts themselves and other existing publications, such as the Scottish Consolidated Fund account, have also been expanded to include additional levels of disclosure on areas such as borrowing and investments. These changes have increased transparency on existing and new powers, but there is more to do. By March next year, we intend to publish a tailored for Scotland consolidated public account. This is challenging, not least because of the large number of bodies that it embraces. We have been gathering data from financial year 2016-17 to help shape and inform our approach. And the new publication will significantly expand the information available on Scotland's devolved public finances. We look forward to engaging with the committee Audit Scotland and other interested parties as we consult on the form and content early in the new year. The publication of a new national performance framework during the course of this year has also resulted in us reviewing how we report performance and in particular the link between spending and outcomes. We will continue to engage with Audit Scotland as this work develops. So we have made progress but in her report, the Auditor General has also made recommendations for further improvements in transparency, particularly around capital borrowing and the government's intervention in private companies. As outlined in my letter to the committee of 23rd of November, we accept those recommendations and will act on them. I welcome external scrutiny, but internal scrutiny is important too. The changes to the tax and spend landscape demands, demands appropriate governance arrangements to challenge our work within the Scottish Government. As the Auditor General acknowledges, I changed arrangements during 2017 in order to meet these additional demands, including the creation of and appointment to new roles such as the Director General Scottish Exchequer and a Chief Financial Officer. I'm also strengthening that internal scrutiny further Interviews are currently taking place to appoint additional non-executive directors with a particular focus on areas including tax, accounting and digital. I shall monitor the effectiveness of these arrangements and look forward to hearing Audit Scotland's views in their report on the 2018-19 accounts. 
Convener, I'm sure I don't need to tell you or the committee that these are challenging times, not least for the Scottish Government and the civil service in responding to current events while maintaining competence in day-to-day -day delivery of outcomes for the people of Scotland. This includes a need to be open, capable and responsive in our transparency agenda. And so I welcome the profile that the consolidated accounts on our other publications are being afforded. I'm happy to answer questions that you and other members of the committee might have. Thank you very much indeed, Permanent Secretary. I'm going to ask Bill Bowman to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Permanent Secretary. You wrote a letter to the committee and in that you said that you do not believe that the accounts are the best place for an extensive review of the government's achievements and suggest that instead you might signpost readers to more detailed sources of information. Firstly, can, can I just confirm that you still agree that the consolidated account should be extended to include all those assets, liabilities, operations that you have responsibility for or stewardship over, as you were discussing, I think, in your so, opening statement? So we're intending, and we can talk a little bit more, myself and colleagues, about our plans to produce a consolidated account. That will be for devolved public spend in Scotland. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so then you're suggesting that there may be more detailed um, information placed elsewhere than in the um, however many pages of, of the financial statements. Do you think it's helpful to direct individuals to multiple sources of information rather than having one? Well, in short, no, I don't. And the idea of having our performance reporting becoming both more transparent and more accessible needs uh, requires us to look at the amount of information we produce, but also where we locate that. So there are two proposals that we're working on at the moment. One of those is to um, look at, yes, where the accounts might be able to give us a little bit more opportunity to provide information, but more likely to look at current places and current websites and consolidate information in websites that we're using at the moment. You talked earlier on about um, performance particularly, and I think we need to differentiate between the Scottish Government's performance as an organisation which will always probably be in the Scottish Government's website for that kind of information, as opposed to progress on outcomes and the national performance framework. And we're differentiating between those two, particularly because the Scottish Government's performance is its own responsibility and the website is the right place for us to go into detail about how we're doing there. The national performance framework, and as I mentioned in my opening comments, is now refreshed. Has we have responsibility for that, but so do large numbers of other public authorities in Scotland, not least since the legislation which places a duty on them. So we need to have a website that takes account of a multiple in inputs from a number of authorities. We have curatorial responsibility for the National Performance Framework, but the important thing is for people to be able to um, look and one place to look at our progress as Scotland owns the National Performance Framework, and that's the work we're undertaking at the moment. I could say a little bit more about that and who we're involving in that process as, as committee requires. Can I just then ask for your um, assurance or confirmation? If you put information in the consolidated accounts at the moment, they are subject to some form of scrutiny by Audit Scotland because they're associated with the financial statements. If you then spread information around other sources and other websites, will you um, require the same scrutiny from Audit Scotland on that information? Well, we're, we're working with and would want to work more closely with Audit Scotland on the scrutiny that's available to the National Performance Framework and where the website lends information for that purpose. But I think what I'm saying is we're looking at two quite distinctive but linked websites which will both be referenced and have a relationship with our accounts, of course. One of them will be about progress against the National Performance Framework, which covers all of Scotland and a number of public authorities. The other is, as you would expect, bread and butter uh, performance by the Scottish Government in its own website. And the two need to link and connect to each other. So my point is that if you reference something from the financial statements, I would expect that that is given scrutiny by the auditors. Yes, and the, and the auditors will be holding us to account on the National Performance Framework as well. Okay. And ask Sarwar. Good morning. Uh, you mentioned um, in your opening statement around the uh, recommendations about loans to, to private companies and the relationship with private companies, and, and I welcome 
Um, your comments say that you will um, accept in full all of the Auditor General's recommendations around uh, those loans. Um, this is an issue around obviously transparency about transparency in the Parliament about how decisions are made, but also transparency with the public around how decisions are made and what the level of any investment and what the potential return of any investment is. So, so can you detail uh, what framework or plans you have in place uh, to put in place a framework in the first and foremost about how decisions will be made if any money does go to private companies and what that looks like, and also what plans you have in place to do some transparency around some of the investments that the Scottish Government has already made. Okay. So if I can take the first part of your, your question. We have a, quite an extensive framework already in place, um, which includes UK and other legislation, our own economic policies and supporting documentation, uh, the economic strategy, for example, and a, a whole realm of guidance, um, procedures, expertise and oversight and, and scrutiny which are all brought into play in any um, discussions and any uh, supporting of sound Scottish Government decision making on investment in private companies. And of course all of this is subject to um, the Scottish Public Finance Manual as you would expect. Um, what we need to look at, I think, is two elements of this. We need to be clear about why and where the Scottish Government might invest, which we would go to an economic strategy or our manufacturing action plan, and then how the Scottish Government might invest, which is guided by the Scottish Government's medium-term finance strategy. And that asks pretty searching questions of us, as it should, in terms of business case, due diligence, uh, benefits, affordability, risks, and so on. So uh, we need to be able to bring all of that together to ensure that people are aware of the considerable evaluation, testing um, and due diligence that takes place. And one of the places that we might want to locate that, because it's all there, but your point is bringing it together in a framework, is possibly to look about the best vehicle that currently exists that could accommodate and make clear to people the kinds of decisions that we're taking and the granular activity that takes place before we take any in, uh, decisions on investment in, in private companies. That's um, something that Gordon might want to say something a little bit more about. He's been very involved in these processes. But it's possible that we might want to look at the Scottish Public Finance Manual as a place where we lay out for everybody to see and understand what the processes are that need to take place, the hoops that need to be covered very coherently before we take those decisions. Thank you. Your, your uh, second sorry, point yeah, was sorry, about... Yeah, sorry. No, absolutely right. Your second point, I think, was about publicly available information and the role of Parliament. So, again, one of the things that we do do is we make, we make numerous loans and investments, as you all know, through a whole range of um, uh, tools and, and uh, processes. And we ensure that those are reported through schemes approved by the Parliament as part of our budget. So you'll be aware of some of those. There's very, too many to, to mention here. But there are, as you have said, a very small number of um, investments which have a higher profile and are likely to be in the public interest to disclose, including levels of financial risk. Um, I'm very mindful, as are others, of the important role that the Scottish Parliament plays in this, and that's one of the reasons why the Cabinet Secretary informed the Finance Committee of both of the investments and loan processes that were underway earlier on in 2017-18 year. So uh, no, no concerns were raised at that process, but I'm confident that we need to make sure that we're clear about when those circumstances would require us to want to make sure that the Parliament and through that the public was aware. And those are going to be a small number, um, but they will have the criteria of um, maintaining commercial confidentiality, which is something we may want to talk a bit further about. Um, secondly, legal obligations but most importantly, the need to consider the risks to the value and the intended impact of the investment itself. As I said, Gordon may wish to talk particularly about the two that were um, probably in your mind at the time. Yeah, I was, I was going to raise two specific examples, obviously around um, Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited and Burnt Island Fabrications Limited. Um, are you able to give any details today about the extent of those uh, investments, what our equity stake is, what our expected return is? whether we have any plans to, to take any further investment, any further loans, um, or when we plan to sell those assets off, or if we plan to sell them off? So you'll appreciate that there is a level of commercial confidentiality still at op operating here, and that's one of the reasons why we were talking to Finance Committee earlier on about that. Um, they're quite early on, both of those investments and those decisions, but Gordon may wish to say a little bit more about what our process would be um, as and when we took decisions and how Parliament would be involved in that. So um, there are no plans at the moment to either sell off or to accelerate in any way the repayment uh, procedures that are already in place for both of those investments. 
and you, you'll be aware that in the accounts themselves, there was a, a fair amount of disclosure about the extent of both of the loan arrangements that were actually put in place. So the question here is not really about um, if information about these investments goes into the public domain. The question is really about when is the most appropriate time to do that. And that goes to the two specific points that the Permanent Secretary mentioned. One is about commercial confidentiality in any specific agreements, legal agreements that might have been entered into. But more specifically, in situations such as this, which, which can often be um, fairly, um, you know, if you look at the two, the two examples, in particular BIFAB, um, which was obviously significantly in the public domain, um, th there's a question about just exactly when that information goes into the public domain and whether or not, by putting that information in the public domain at an earlier point, it places at risk even more the investment that the government has actually made. So. So it's always difficult knowing when to do that, but quite often it's dictated by things like the ability to be able to win contracts. And both organisations are in processes at the moment where they're looking to um, to actually be awarded contracts. So we feel that once those processes are over, that would be a more appropriate time to then put more information into the public domain. Ms. Rose, would you would you accept that there is an issue around transparency, particularly this is public money we're talking about, taxpayers' money we're talking about, and the public having a right to know what companies they're investing in, how much they're investing in, and when and if they're likely to get a return on their um, investment. And, and isn't there also an issue, and I'm, I'm not meaning with the particulars we're discussing today, but more broadly in terms of a principle, mm -hmm. that there is a risk with a lack of full transparency and a lack of a publicly available framework, that there is a risk that it might appear at least that decisions are being made for perhaps political reasons, for other reasons, and not purely financial or, or economic reasons. No, I, I, I can see why, why you might say that. I mean, the key, one of the key issues to understand here is that when the government acts in intervening in private companies, it has to do so in the same way that a commercial investor would. We're required under the market economy investor principle set out in the EU's state aid framework to actually act in the way that a, a private investor would. So this isn't a case of the government being able to inject whatever funds it actually feels is appropriate. It has to do so in the same way that a commercial investor would. So that, that relates to things like the amount of the investment, the expected return, and the duration over which that lending actually takes place. So it's entirely done on a commercial basis. Um, the accounts themselves are the appropriate vehicle normally to disclose those, and as you'll have seen from the 2017 and 18 accounts, there is a fair amount of information that's already gone into the public domain through those accounts, and that's normally the primary vehicle, unless there's an appropriate parliamentary statement that's required, but that would normally be the vehicle through which we would disclose information on loans. As the Permanent Secretary also said, the, the government makes a significant number of loans every year, and I accept that there has been quite an amount of an em emphasis on these two particular loans, but, but we normally do not disclose the detail of every single loan that goes to every individual or indeed company, but we, we believe that the public interest was best served by singling out these two examples, and that's why the disclosures in the accounts are the way that they are. Further to that, do you accept there is at least the risk of political interference in terms of making decisions about which companies get loans and which ones don't? So, in, uh, I mean, we've, we've talked briefly about a framework. So, the government's required, in order, as I've already said, is order to require, required rather, to act in the same way as our commercial investor would in this space. I think the other thing that's important to bear in mind here is that there are regularity, propriety, and value for money considerations that's incumbent on the accountable officer who's making the advice and indeed for the permanent secretary as the principal accountable officer in that space. So those all require the senior civil servant who's making the recommendation to the minister to do so within that framework of regularity. So is it legal and is, does government have powers to do this? Is this the type of thing that parliament would expect funding to be utilised on? And does this demonstrate value for money for the public purse? And those three things, there are comprehensive assessments on all three of those things before um, the advice actually goes to the, um, so the, the relevant that, minister. Just on that, Mr. Will, so I, I can understand the hesitancy in publishing all that information whilst it's still commercially sensitive. But once it no longer is commercially sensitive, either because we have a return on our investment and we've moved on, or there's no further investment planned, 
would you be happy to publish all the, all those information, all that communication, all those analysis? I think that's something we want to discuss with ministers, but um, and and of course the other thing we'd want to be clear on is whether or not there were any legal requirements that that meant that we couldn't put that information in the public domain. But but in principle, yes. Okay. Might I come back in one one point about that? Um, I think. Uh, Gordon's right. In principle, yes, and I absolutely take your point about transparency and public interest in this. That's one of the reasons why the pretty onerous sets of responsibilities and tests that we have to pass, bringing those together into one place so that people can see and understand what needs to be um, uh, gone through before any of these decisions are taken uh, is an important part of increasing that transparency. You're talking, I know, about specific instances, but actually bringing that into the public domain may assure people that there is a uh, limited opportunity to take anything other than very well-informed and pretty well-tested um, decisions on these investments. Thank you, Permanent Secretary. Just, just one final quick question around the, uh, the Two Sisters plant, which is obviously relevant to my, my own region. Um, obviously, there was a financial support in terms of a, a timeline for how long the company would still uh, be in existence and, and operational. That has not been... Uh, delivered, what are the process in terms of recovering money that has been given to companies who haven't then gone on to fulfil their promises? Gordon may want to say something about that. So if, if there are loan arrangements in place, then those loan arrangements are legal undertakings that are entered into by the companies, and so the government would be expected to um, recoup those investments at a later point. Obviously, if there were circumstances that then meant that the company was in administration or some other factor that meant that it wasn't to, it wasn't able to, then it would it would fall into line in the same way as any other creditor. Thank you, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, just very briefly to follow on from Mr. Sawar's question, uh, Mr. Wales, uh, how does the Scottish government decide when it will inform the Scottish Parliament? Uh, about provision of particular loan facilities? So I think it's important to recognise that there's no specific point in, in the process. So, you know, there isn't, a, there isn't a, a specific point from the point at which a minister will make a decision. It's generally dictated by the circumstances associated with the individual case. And so, uh, it, for example, if we look at um, the timing of when the information entered the public domain, on BIFAB, then that surrounded what was clearly a very public campaign and the Cabinet Secretary at the time decided to make a parliamentary statement on it associated with what was happening in the company at that time. But as I said earlier on, the normal vehicle in which this type of information would enter the public domain would be through the consolidated accounts and the disclosures associated with those accounts unless ministers feel that it is appropriate to do so at an earlier point. It, just to be clear it's entirely the minister's decision at an early stage whether or not parliament ever gets to hear about this well obviously ministers will take advice from civil servants about um, whether or not it's important to put information into the public domain at an earlier point in time i think it's difficult to be precise about every single case because this, the, the the circumstances in every case are obviously very different and I think it's important to reflect back on the point that I made earlier on about the commercial sensitivity associated with where a company is at as far as its cash flow at a particular point in time. And one of the things we have to consider very, very carefully is whether or not putting something into the public domain at a particular point in time may actually have adverse implications for the company's finances. So it's always a fine balancing act. I'd like to turn to capital borrowing if I may, uh, the uh, Scottish Government borrowed £450 million worth of capital funds this year, which I think is its annual limit. Uh, so how does the Scottish Government decide on that level of borrowing and the type of borrowing it's going to do uh, in relation to capital borrowing and for what purposes has it been used this year? So Gordon may want to say something about the specific infrastructure projects that have been funded or have been um, started, initiated with the um, 450 million pounds. But the borrowing is agreed in advance with the Treasury, with Her Majesty's Treasury, um, including a clear articulation of the projects, the infrastructure investment that this will encapsulate, that this will reflect, and their associated um, amounts. So what it's going to be spent on, how much it's going to cost. But also, these projects have to meet a threshold uh, test for being assets for the period of 25 years. So it's done over a, a particular period of time, and it has to be demonstrated that these assets will be assets for the 25-year duration of at least 25 years, possibly more. 
and that supports our request for the £450 million over a period of 25 years. So there's some very specific tests that we have to go through with Her Majesty's Treasurer, Treasury on the amount of money that we're funding. Clearly, we're also looking at infrastructure plans, the economic plan, and a whole range of other policy areas about where and when we're spending that particular investment. But Gordon might want to talk a little bit more about the background to some of the projects that were invested, or Alison, likewise. Yeah, I, I can do that if it would be helpful. There were nine specific projects. Would it be helpful for me to tell you what they are just now? Yeah, okay, so... so Quite briefly, that would, that would help me, Mr Wales. Thank you. Okay, so fourth replacement cross me, crossing was £75 million. Uh, The trunk road programme of A9, A90, A96 and A737 was £116 million. The Northern Isles ferry service vessels was £36 million. Fourth Valley College was £10 million. NHS hospital buildings for Balfour Hospital was £47 million, for Gart Naval Hospital was £10 million, Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary in Ed <coughs> Edinburgh Sick Kids was £71 million, Rigmore Theatres was £11 million, and NHS Scotland Estate Enhancements was £74 million. And that's the total of £450 million. And if, if I might just add as well, um, in terms of the planned level of capital borrowing, that's actually set by Scottish ministers at the time of setting the 2017-18 budget. As you'll know, because you received the reports on the major capital projects, there's a whole range of different financing tools that are used for the overall investment programme. Capital borrowing is one, and that is very much um, dictated and constrained by the fiscal framework in terms of that maximum limit that you already mentioned of £450 million a year. But there's other uh, revenue-financed investment. There's the block grant on capital as well. So it, actually, there's a mix of funding arrangements that cover the whole infrastructure program. Um, obviously, so they, the ministers chose in 2017-18 to use the maximum borrowing amount so that they could continue that investment in Scotland's infrastructure. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, the decision then about what is used and how it is used, then obviously the borrowing in any one year because this is all about managing the cash flow of, gr of grants that go out to these bodies, as Gordon has mentioned. These bodies receive these as grants. They don't need to repay it. It's all part of the overall management of Scotland's finances that the Scottish Government will repay on those loans. And the timing of that borrowing in that year is left as late as possible for managing cash flow. And as you'd appreciate, if you're thinking of your own personal loans or mortgages, the later you leave it in a year, then that reduces the amount of interest that has to be paid on that uh, borrowing in the particular year. The borrowing in 2017-18 used the National Loans Fund and on the terms that were secured was actually those as the best value terms <laughs> available to us under the constraints of the fiscal framework for 2017-18. So that's just giving that sort of rounder picture on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and following on from that, and certainly Permanent Secretary, uh, in your opening statement you talked about the policies, uh, you, you accepted the recommendations that were in the uh, report and one of the recommendations is that the Scottish Government needs to finalise the policies and principles uh, within which it manages its borrowing powers. Uh, so do you have any indication of when the Scottish Government will finalise those policies and principles? Yes, I think our view would be we do have those policy and principles at our fingertips. I think bringing them together so that they're clearly, going back to the point that was made earlier on, clearly understood and recognised by a wider audience is part of our, our endeavour. And Alison might like to talk a little bit about that and what, that, what would make up that, that framework. Yes, so um, the key thing is actually about where, where this is all brought together. So one of the recommendations from the government's um, and the parliament's work on the budget process and the budget process review group of parliament was actually around the medium term financial strategy. The publication in May this year was Scotland's fiscal outlook, the Scottish government's five year financial strategy, this particular publication. So this will be um, refreshed again next um, spring, in spring 2019. And that will be the main place where all our policies are brought together. And that's where the capital borrowing policies will also be placed. So that will be the time to do that. And obviously, in bringing this together, we'll take full account of the Auditor General's recommendations. He was asking particularly about finalising. So all fiscal policies, including the policies on the use of borrowing, have to be kept under review to ensure that they continue to be fit for purpose and in the light of our experience and changing economic circumstances. 
So the intention is that the approach set out in this document, the medium term financial strategy in spring 2019, would be maintained for some time. Um, but I think it's fair to say, you know, to call it final, because we have to keep these things as live and active. But that, that's the, this will be the main place where it's all brought together. Thank, Thank you. you. Alex Neil. Can I just, first of all, just ask, where does Gordon fit into the organisation chart? Because he's missing in this one. So he, he doesn't answer to Alison, though there is, as you can see, a clearly very effective working relationship between them. Um, but he actually uh, uh, res is responsible to uh, another Director General who looks after the whole corporate uh, responsibilities and functions of right, the government. Okay. Right, OK. Right, um, <coughs> OK. Can I uh, ask, first of all, uh, following up in a sense and what Anis was saying in relation to housing, uh, down the years, for many years now, under successive administrations, um, we have supported individuals through shared equity schemes to be able to buy their own home. And the cumulative value of the, the, uh, the government's equity in, the, in housing now must, well, must actually be into billions rather than hundreds of millions. So can I ask, what is now the cumulative outstanding value of that investment? Secondly, uh, are we sure that every time we, somebody sells a house with shared equity, we recover the money? Uh, and thirdly, uh, do we, I know we didn't used to, but do we charge any interest on that shared equity, uh, which is relevant for other purposes? So I don't have that information myself to hand, and I think we might need to write to you with a bit more of that information, but it may be that colleagues and Gordon may want to say something in his, some comments on it. So I don't have the immediate sum with me at the moment, but very happy to write to you on that. The government does recover these sums where it is entirely possible. There are conditions, as you know, set out for the recovery of these loans, so the government does take action to recover them. Um, you may remember that when the original help to buy schemes were announced, uh, in England and Wales, the UK government decided that it would charge fees after five years um, for effectively the benefit of, of being able to take part in those shared equity schemes. Ministers here decided not to charge such fees, so there are no fees or interest associated with those schemes. Okay. Uh, but as well as, you know, the, the bit about assurance of, of, of uh, cashing in when the, the house is sold or when the person dies, uh, can you put in your reply to us some uh, indication of what processes are used to make sure you capture that, because it's not always going to be the case, especially now some of them will have been in the house for 15 or 20 years, uh, possibly. Um, so do they always tell you uh, when the house is sold or when somebody dies? Yeah, so I'd be very happy to write um, as part of telling you what the, the latest outstanding figures are, and I'd be happy to do that as of now rather than at the... 31st of March date as far as the accounts are concerned and I'll set out the procedures associated with it as well. Okay. Can I ask about a, a wider question? Um, <clears throat> two of the government's key strategic objectives are improving the level of economic growth and creating a fairer Scotland. Can I ask if there is any systematic analysis done, particularly prior to uh, policy changes in budgets, on the impact of both revenue and expenditure in Scotland, including council tax and business rates, on, biz on growth and the impact on the fairer distribution of income and wealth. So I think that relates to the national performance framework and the, the refreshed outcomes that we now are operating to. And Alison may want to say a couple of words just about that. Yes, yeah, so obviously in terms of the national performance framework, um, there's a range of indicators that are being collected. Some of those with the new framework actually are new indicators. Um, so we will actually be able to report on a range of them, but there will be um, a small number. So out of the 81 indicators, there's 16 that um, just because there's new data that needs to be collected and to get a time series, some of those data sets will be available in 2019, 2020. So that will stretch over that particular period of time. Um, but certainly in terms of um, taking into account, you were saying particularly about revenues. Mm -hmm. So obviously in terms of the economic fortunes and the economic impact of revenues, then um, the forecasts of revenues are now generated, as you know, by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. 
and they will take into account a range of, fa of factors in generating what those amounts are going to be that the government um, uses in its budget. The statute says that the government needs to use those figures or if it chooses not to, has to explain why. So that um, independent body that generates those figures actually will take into account a range of um, economic circumstances and a degree of behavioural effects um, so that actually that, that is reflected in our revenues. Um, and similarly, in terms of the block grant, the block grant that we then use as well towards expenditure will take into account some economic and uh, tax receipt factors um, as generated by the OBR and their assessment. So there's some very high level, but there's um, very specific circumstances now that are in place, again, driven by the fiscal framework agreement between the UK government and the Scottish government. But if we take a couple of examples, um, the proposal to reduce air passenger duty at some point, I, I realise that's not possible at the moment until there's resolution to other issues. Uh, and council tax, because clearly one of the things we saw last year was that every one of the 32 councils increased council tax, usually to the maximum of 3%. So where, where <coughs> before the decision is taken on local government funding for the budget for next year, is there a, an analysis undertaken of the impact of potential reductions or increases in local government funding, the potential impact of that funding and the potential impact on council tax policy and particularly if council tax rises, does that further make Scotland fairer or unfair, un more unfair? The main, the main focus of analysis, not surprisingly, is about that particular interface between business and local and central government around the non-domestic rate income. And so that, that is particularly the focus, because obviously that's the area where there is a direct relationship between government policy and ultimately what is part of a, a funding um, package that councils adopt and use in their own local areas. But uh, what I'm getting at, we're spending a lot of money trying to create a fairer Scotland on the expenditure side. Meantime, on the revenue side, particularly in relation to council tax, we're making Scotland more unfair. It seems to be a contradiction. Uh, so I, my question is, do we look at the impact of, uh, for example, council tax or air passenger duty? I mean, has there been any work done, not so much a realisable work done on the growth impact of reducing air passenger duty, but has there been any work done on the fairness of reducing air passenger duty? So the main, um, in terms of air passenger duty, the main work has been actually on the economic growth of reducing it. So no work has been done on the fairness of it? Um, can I just say that all of our policies are tested against the fairness issues. It, I think the points you're pointing out particularly are the technical elements of air passenger duty, of course, but council tax as well. But um, we are under responsibility to check and test and advise on the basis of not just um, the, the revenue incurred, but any fairness issues that might be uh, incurred as part of a decision on a, on a fiscal basis. So uh, Alison is quite correct. She's talking about a particular aspect and particular aspect in terms of, of raising taxes. But all our policies are also um, tested against um, the issue of fairness and indeed not least because we've got a huge commitment, as you will be very well aware of, in terms of reducing poverty yeah. and some very clear reducing poverty targets. So they, they need to be tested against those circumstances as well. Obviously we're not hitting those targets. In fact, child poverty is going through the roof. We, so could you say... I'm talking about a, targets so that can, we've set out for ourselves can, as can, the Scottish Government yes. in the future, yes, which are still to be met and are going to be very absolutely, challenging. Absolutely. So if you're doing that, could you send us maybe an example of where, with, say with air passenger duty, what analysis has, has been done on the fairness impact uh, and what the conclusions were, and the same with the potential impact on council tax increases? Okay. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Coffee. Thanks very much. Convener, just a couple of questions from me, please. One on the, the underspend that's reported in the accounts. And the other one on internal audit that was raised by the Auditor General. Firstly, in the underspend, it's reported that it's a £339 million underspend this year, um, which is a good, a good bit higher than previous year's underspend. So firstly, to ask for an explanation of why uh, there's such a difference. And just to, to also confirm 
the, the underspend amount ultimately is used, carried forward and deployed effectively and so forth to, to future spend. So I wonder if you could maybe clarify a wee bit around that, please, Leslie. Surely. So the £339 million headline, as you might imagine, judging by your question, actually covers a multitude of different um, decisions. And some of these, uh, the, these decisions are intentional and deliberate. So Scottish ministers plans to make use of what is now the new um, Scottish reserve effective from April 2017 to carry forward £235 million of that chunk of money to support additional expenditure included in the 2018-19 budget. Um, and that was approved by the Scottish Parliament. So a significant amount of that is already being used and, uh, and was carried over to 2018-19. Um, we've also got within that a significant sum of money which is accounting underspend, which is due to technical shifts. So AME, as we would call it, money which cannot be used for services. Some of the quite a large proportion of the education underspend, for example, is to do with that which could not be used because of the nature of the of the, of the cash, as it were. It's not able to be used for cash purposes. And we have some small elements of that as well, particularly again in education, where we've had money that we've ring fenced because it's not been spent this year. So. Gordon was talking about uh, Fourth Valley College earlier on, which has some capital um, investments. It hasn't actually managed to trigger all the spend during that year, and so was carried forward. So the vast majority of the money has been, as you said rightly, carried forward intentionally, in, in fact, in one in case of one significant chunk of it, for spend during 1819. Which means, actually, I think, if we look at the, um, the overall fiscal underspend, I think I'm right in saying, but Gordon will keep me right on this, that actually it's 0.2% of our spending power, uh, which was underspent overall. I think that's the correct figure. Yes, that's correct. Mm. Just a couple of additional points for me. It's, it's important to understand that um, some areas of funding cannot be carried forward. So the Permanent Secretary referred there to, to a couple of different things. So one is we use something called non-cash, which is effectively to deal with depreciation. So it's money that cannot be spent on public goods or services. It's provided by the Treasury in order to deal with depreciation and impairment of assets. The other thing is the annually managed expenditure budget, the, the AME budget that the Permanent Secretary referred to. It can only be used on a very small number of items, in, and two in particular, which are student loans and um, NHS and teachers' pensions. Those budgets are ring-fenced by the Treasury and so cannot be used, cannot for other purposes, and cannot be carried forward. Everything else that is effectively in what's called departmental expenditure limits, DEL funding, has been carried forward through the Scotland Reserve. Its spending power has been absolutely maintained and is deployed in this or future years. The transparency angle that has been led by Bill just at the outset there, how do the public see the movement through to the next year of a usable underspend from the previous year? For example, it's reported in the accounts that the underspend last year was £85 million. Pounds. So the usable element of that, how do the public get a sense of where that's being spent and earmarked? Is it demand-led spend at the time or is it already earmarked and set aside spend? So how does the public get a sense of where it's going? So, so two things. One is that in, in terms of how the money is carried forward and what happens in and out the Scotland Reserve, that's all produced in a new publication, the Fiscal Framework Outturn Report, and that was published a couple of months ago. So there's a fairly detailed set of tables there that explain what happened before 2017-18, the transfers in and out of the Scotland Reserve, and what the picture then looks like at the start of 2018 and 19. So, so there is full transparency in what's happening there. The sums that were carried forward into this year, in particular the sums that were used and deployed in the budget process for this year, um, the Cabinet Secretary set that out when he um, set out plans for his budget back in, in January of this year. Um, in particular, he set out the, the details associated with the sums that he was carrying forward and how, we, how they were being deployed as part of the overall budget for 2018-19. Question on internal audit as well, I think. Um, yes. Do you want to just briefly repeat that? I, I'm quite keen to, to hear from the witnesses on that as well. Yeah, of course, I'll t turn to that. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that the whole process of internal audit has been raised at this committee. The quality of internal audit 
right across, across the public sector landscape has been raised by a number of colleagues here over months, if not years. And in the Auditor General's report, we see a comment here that although the Internal Audit Directorate meets some of the public sector and internal audit standards, it doesn't comply with significant aspects of the standards. It was just to get your your comment on that and what we're planning to do about, about this. So I'll take it in two parts. In terms of the public sector internal audit standards, um, the Scottish Government internal audit undergoes the test against those standards as every other public sector internal audit does over, I think it's a period of every five years, and they will be tested against those. Their turn has come up, if you like, uh, in the first part of 2019. So they will be tested against all those, I think, 56 standards at that point, and that is the normal rhythm of testing, and we should be ready um, and keen to see the result of that evaluation. The second part of what I would like to say is there has been an enormous amount, and I think Audit Scotland, to be fair, have creditors with this, an, an enormous amount of work and investment in the quality and nature of our internal audit service. So um, at the time of the Audit Scotland review, there was already a back to basics review, as we called it at that time, which um, looked at the rewrite of the audit manual, looked at investment in staff training, um, additional quality assurance processes, and we also brought in Grant Thornton for external testing and expertise to see um, what they could add to checking and challenging our internal audit services. In addition, as you'll see from the Scottish Exchequer family tree that we circulated with my letter, we have a director level uh, of, at the top of the internal audit um, structure now uh, with a remit to ensure that the internal audit is fit for purpose. Um, and she has also been given additional staff resources to ensure that the pretty hefty workload that internal audit in the Scottish Government undertakes is feasible and, and that she has the capability and skills to do so. And she's brought in quality assurance processes, so customer service um, surveys, implemented training and development strategy. So a lot of investment and uh, quite rightly an investment in a very important part of our scrutiny and accountability services. And that goes back to one of the things that I did when I first came in as permanent secretary, which is to look at the governance and assurance arrangements for the organisation as a whole. I don't know if Alison wants to say anything more about that, but that would be my, my response to you. Yes, certainly. Yeah, there's, there's extensive work that's been done. It's led by someone who's professionally qualified, also not only as a chartered accountant, but actually as an internal auditor, has specific qualifications, and has been leading a change programme um, to actually just make sure that these these functions and activities. The work of internal audit obviously is there to make sure that our internal controls, um, not only for us as a government, for the other bodies, um, they provide that independent objective assurance and advisory activity to make sure that value is added to our organisation's operations. Um, so that the skills are there to actually be able to advise us on risk management, um, economic and efficient use of resources, compliance with policies and procedures, laws and regulations, to safeguard against losses, and to ensure that the integrity and reliability of our information and data is there. So that's part of what they cover. The other thing I think is worth drawing out in the conclusions, um, both from Audit Scotland and also the review as well that takes place by our internal Scottish Government Audit and Assurance Committee, is that Audit Scotland did not identify any internal audit reports where the underlying evidence would suggest an incorrect audit opinion or conclusion. But um, I can absolutely assure you, I met with the team myself on Monday this week. They're absolutely um, working through the Back to Basics project and uh, making sure that all those important foundations in the six of the 56 areas that Audit Scotland identified are actually corrected. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Permanent Secretary... Can I say on this internal audit point, I mean, we, we've we looked at internal audits um, quite extensively in this committee and we find that problems start there and then escalate in governance and, and management of many of our public sector organisations. I find it really worrying as the Scottish Government has to do a project to go back to basics on its own internal audit procedures. And I, I think some of the problems that the Auditor General identified are really quite worrying. How did it get to that point? I think the title Back to Basics was not intended to be one of alarm. It was more intended to show the comprehensive nature of a new uh, internal audit director coming in, fully qualified, as Alison said, 
to look at the top to bottom nature and see whether it was satisfied it was satisfactory for her purposes and the purpose of which she was appointed which was to look at giving us a clean bill of health so I wouldn't want anybody to be alarmed by the title alone. However, I think it is important that we recognise the crucial nature of that service and indeed the stretch that has been placed on it as our powers and responsibilities have grown as an organisation. We're now operating in a completely different um, set of uh, services, operational as well as policy for Scotland in a way that couldn't have been envisaged a few years back. So it's quite appropriate that we take the temperature of the supporting services, and that's not just internal audit actually, that's just much to do with HR, um, finance, the way that we govern our business. Um, it's very important that we take an opportunity to step back and check that we have what we need for what is a set of responsibilities and operational responsibilities in particular that we previously didn't have. But I, I, one, one final thing I would say is, although uh, I think the, um, it was stated that the internal audit director reports to Alison and for pay and rations, that's correct. The internal audit director has a line of accountability to me as well, so can come and talk to me at any time about the nature of what's going on in the organisation and similarly to any of the other accountable officers as well. And a direct line to a newly formed Scottish Government Audit and Assurance Committee, which is a big part of the internal audits uh, process. OK, but the title does suggest you needed to go back to the basic principles of audit. Uh, I asked how far back this goes. Are you saying that it went back to the first further devolution of power? Is that when problems started to emerge? No, not identifying problems. I think Alison has already said that we don't have any reason to believe that the product and the quality of what internal order has been doing within the Scottish Government has got anything other than a full endorsement uh, and, uh, and our confidence. What it doesn't comply with significant aspects of the standards. That's the public sector internal audit standards. But, that, but in the, uh, Audit Scotland also said that they recognise the amount of work and investment that had been placed into internal audit pre predating uh, the review and uh, recognise the importance that we're placing on the investment in internal audit. Um, I don't think we can do anything more than continue to invest in support and ensure that internal audit's voice is heard strongly within the organisation. And I go back to its reporting, lines of reporting to the Scottish, the most senior uh, board of the Scottish Government on assurance and audit, and to me too. OK, I think I asked you, I mean, I know you maybe take issue with the, the term problems, but when did issues start to emerge and what caused that? Was it the further devolution of power? I don't, I can't say, and I wouldn't identify problems starting at any time. I think what we have tried to do is ensure that we look, take a fresh look at the demands on the internal audit service at a time when we are being stretched and um, being asked to accommodate and grow to take on further powers. So I think this will, const this will be a gardening process. We will constantly and rightly be checking that what we have in the way of internal audit facilities and challenge is strong, effective and well resourced. What's the timescale for this project to complete? I mean, I know you will continue, you just said you'll continually monitor it, but this, this pe back to basics piece of work. So my understanding, and Alison will keep me right on this, is that all of the processes that I've talked about are either in train or complete. But Alison may want to talk a bit more detail about uh, yes. that. The, the review is done. Grant Thornton has completed their work. The new manual is in place. The training has taken place. And as I say, the, then the next particular milestone will be the spring, where there is that third party separate assessment, in addition to Audit Scotland continuing to review internal audit and the Scottish Government Audit and Assurance Committee keeping track on the progress that's being made. So it's now about just this continued um, uh, reflection to make sure that what has been trained and put in place and the reviews that are happening confirm that um, the good work is still is still there. Okay, so um, Ms Stafford, how long do you think it'll take to comply, to fully comply with the public sector internal audit standards? Do you have a time scale for that? So um, the work that's in place is to ensure that is happening. Okay. And we'll, we'll be tested against that. My Next understanding spring. is that we'll be, we'll be tested against that in the spring, yeah, as right. I said earlier on. So we will be coming up to the end of our five-year cycle on that. OK, thank you. Can I turn to outcomes? Because this is mentioned in the, um, in the Auditor General's report as well. Um, we know, and there's been um, several uh, 
pieces in the media recently about the huge amount of spend, particularly on NHS and uh, health and social care integration, which we're just about to scrutinise with the Auditor General after your session, that amounts to nearly half of, of the Scottish budget now. But how can we as, as politicians assure the public about this level of expenditure when there is really kind of scant uh, evidence on the outcomes that that spending leads to? Well, I think that's a good example of um, a wider point that the Auditor General made about how the budget and outcomes um, correlate. And that is some of the work that we're already undertaking, and um, Alison may want to say a little bit more about this in a minute, um, where we look at how we can make sure that the National Performance Framework, which was refreshed this year, as you know, and includes outcomes on health and others as well, that that framework is the one that we use for our budget decisions to inform our budget decisions and to inform the way in which we present performance information to the Parliament but to public as well. Now, of course, health produces a huge amount of information, a um, huge amount on targets and on other materials and reports, and indeed Audit Scotland reports on how the health service is performing, actually weekly and monthly, as you will be aware. The important element is for us to in also ensure that that information and other indicators of the kind that um, Alison uh, was talking about is brought to bear in terms of the long-term outcomes for Scotland. So many of those outcomes are uh, dependent on health or indeed prevention before it even gets into the health service. So we're looking at how not just we report on the National Performance Framework in, for Scotland in its website, as I said earlier on, how it connects to the budget and how it connects to our um, information that we share with the public. And one of the things that we have been doing is to look at our open government commitments and the report, our second report on open government will come out later on in this year, I think in December. And we've also been working with the Blavatnik School of Government in the University of Oxford, where I'm a fellow and have had a year's worth of their academic um, challenge, I think it's fair to say, as well as assessment on how we connect our work on outcomes to uh, performance and to our budget responsibilities as well. So that work is very much at the core of our performance and national performance framework agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think in your opening statement, Permanent Secretary, you maybe said that you do accept all the recommendations of the Auditor General's report. Is that correct? They are all being addressed as, as we speak, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses on this this morning? Bill? Could I have a, um, a quick clarification from Mr Wales? You mentioned when you were talking about investing in private companies that, that it was done on commercial terms. On market term, can you tell me how you determine what is a commercial term for such an investment? So, because of the complexities associated with these types of investments, we will almost always employ external advisors, and the external advisors will give us advice based on market conditions and the types of deals that are done in particular sectors and with particular companies to tell us whether or not the type of arrangement that we're looking to put in place is actually within the general um, ambit of other deals done in that type of sector. We also, of course, make reference to um, the European Union and state aid regulations that sets out, for example, the associated interest rates and terms that should be associated with particular loans. So are those advisors uh, appointed on a per deal basis or do you have a panel? No, we usually appoint them on a per deal basis. And is that the public who you consult? Um, I, it, it probably is, but I don't think there's any particular reason why. Um, I, I'd be very happy to tell you who those particular advisors are. I would find that. Are, uh, in, well, fact, or you can write and tell I, us. Yeah. I, I, can, um, yeah, I can certainly it's do it. that just now. So Ferguson's with PricewaterhouseCoopers and Bifab with Grant Thornton. Okay. Anything further from members? Can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now suspend the committee for five minutes to allow, to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Item 3 is our Section 23 report on health and social care integration. I'd like to welcome our witnesses for this agenda item. Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Claire Sweeney, Audit Director, Performance and Best Value, and Lee Johnson, Senior Manager, Performance and Best Value, all from Audit Scotland. Can I invite the Auditor General to make a brief opening statement, please? Thank you, Convener. Today's joint report focuses on health and social care integration and provides an update on progress. It looks at what impact the integration of health and social care is having and the barriers and enablers to change. As the committee knows, health and social care are facing increasing pressures and a very challenging financial position. Integration has got the potential to bring about the service transformation that's needed to address these pressures and to bring real benefits to the people who use services and the wider public. We did find evidence that integration can work within the current legislative framework. There's evidence that integration is enabling joined up and collaborative working in some places, and this is leading to improvements in performance, such as a reduction in unplanned hospital activity and delays in hospital discharges. But there's much more to be done and a number of significant barriers that need to be overcome. Integration authorities oversee almost £9 billion of health and care spending, but longer term integrated financial planning is needed to deliver sustainable service reform. The publication of the government's medium term health and social care financial framework is a welcome step, but the detail that underpins it will be important. Importantly, the set aside aspect of the Act is not yet being implemented, and this needs to be resolved urgently in order to shift the balance of care towards community based preventative care in future. Strategic planning also needs to improve, focusing on how integration authorities and their partners will achieve better outcomes for people who need support and ensuring that new ways of working will be sustainable over the longer term. Integration authorities, councils and NHS boards need to establish a clear governance structure where all partners agree responsibility and accountability and put in place the right leaders. We found some examples of small-scale changes in the balance of care, but integration authorities need to achieve wider impact. This means addressing challenges related to data and information sharing and sharing learning from successful approaches right across Scotland. Change can't happen without meaningful and sustained engagement with people, with staff and with politicians right across the country. No one organisation can do this alone. We need to see the Scottish Government, COSLA, councils, NHS boards and integration authorities work together with their staff and communities to scale up the pace of change. Convener will do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. I'm going to ask Alec Neil to open questioning for the committee. Auditor General, the set-aside provisions in the Act are absolutely crucial to the success of integration and, as you see in uh, sections 19 and 20 and 21 of your report, uh, this is one part of the Act. Despite the fact the Act has been in place now for four years and the official start date for integration was uh, three years, getting on for three years ago, that this has not happened uh, and you explain why. Uh, but you also say, quite rightly, in my view, in your introduction, this is now urgent. So what action do you think now needs to be taken by whom to get this sorted? Um, you're absolutely right that unless the um, unplanned hospital care element of the um, resources that were meant to be managed by the integration authorities is actually devolved in practice, there are real limits to the, the amount of change that can happen. Um, we identified some problems with people, first of all, genuinely knowing how much money is affected. But beyond that, we say we don't think that's the fundamental problem. We think it's about people's um, willingness and confidence to really share that information, to think about a joined up health and care budget in their area and to manage it on that basis. Um, so we have set out a number of things in part two of our report that we think need to happen. And we're happy to talk about that in more detail. More generally, though, I think we have reached the stage where the government and COSLA themselves really need to be um, pushing and requiring the local leaders in each part of Scotland to overcome these differences, these um, challenges that they're facing, and put that part of the legislation in, into place. As you say, the legislation's been in um, place for four years now. The um, integration authorities had to be in place by the 1st of April 2016, which is nearly three years ago, and we're not seeing the change we need to. Can I ask then, in terms of the wider financial situation, as I've said before, uh, if you look at the history books and look at when we were closing down the Victorian mental health uh, so-called asylums, a terrible name for them, 
Um, that was done over a, about a five-year period with bridge funding, because you have to fund both services uh, during that transition. Do you think the time has come, as well as dealing with the set-aside issue, uh, on the need to look at using some of the additional funding we're supposed to be getting as a result of the Barnet consequentials from the increase in health spending south of the border, that that should be focused now on making integration work and providing that kind of bridge funding or a similar type of arrangement? Uh, because w when reading your report, even if you even if you sort out the set-aside issue, it seems to me we're not going to make the progress we could and should be making until we recognise that both sets, the acute service, which can't, do, can't handle a reduction because of the increased demand, uh, and the community side, both need uh, to be kept running until we make the transition. I think that should be a real focus of the longer-term integrated financial planning that we're talking about. If I can refer the committee to page 31 of the report, um, where we're talking about the need for that, we highlight there at the bottom of the page that many of the changes that have been made so far have been done with additional funding that's been available from different sources. So that certainly makes it easier and it's very important. The challenge is that we don't yet have those plans where people either nationally or locally can say to get from here to there, we need to spend what we've currently got and for this two years we need an investment of this much either to pump prime or to double run or to invest in new facilities. Um, that planning is important for the IJBs themselves and it's the level of detail that I referred to that needs to underpin the government's health and care financial framework with exactly those questions of how the additional money could be used to um, make that change happen if that's what's needed before we start committing it to other parts of the health and, and, and presumably the, the emphasis has to be in the investment in the community side primary care social care etc also I asked the Paul Gray a few months ago is the time not come now instead of channeling the money to the IGBs via the health boards and the councils for the Scottish Government itself simply to allocate budgets directly for the core statutory functions uh, to the 31 integrated boards. His reply was because of the variation, because some boards have taken on children's services, for example, uh, that was a reason for not doing it. But it seems to me you could do that for the core statutory functions. Uh, if, if the Health Board and the Councils agreed that additional services will be provided by the AGB, let them argue about that. But at least let's get the core statutory functions moving. And it seems to me, you know, we're channeling this money and a lot of the frustration and the friction in the system is because we're giving it to two bodies who then have to negotiate and then, and then after negotiating the amount, then have to delegate the budgets back again. Could we not simplify this whole thing by directly funding the 31 IGBs? Um, I will um, start by saying you asked, you, you were asking exactly the right person whether that funding is possible. Um, I don't think we're in a position to answer it for you. Clearly, the legislation sets out the way IJBs work, and about a third of the £9 billion comes from councils, not from government, so that would need to be resolved. Um, if we look at Exhibit 2, it shows you the way in which the money is coming from health boards and from councils into them, um, and I think the spirit of the legislation is about getting the system to work as a whole. That's been the driver so far. Um, I think if it's not possible to get the system to work as a whole, and this report is very much highlighting that it's happening slowly, government probably does need to look with COSLER at more radical solutions, but we have found some signs that it is starting to work. My focus would be on speeding that up at this point. Right. And my final question is, um, we've now got 31 IGBs. We have still got 22 health boards. Uh, we now have three regional structures in the health service, so that alone is a total of 56 different organisations with all the relevant overhead and so on. Given the financial pressures and given the need to streamline um, the, the management structure, it's now not the time to start uh, looking at this huge overhead, uh, and, and, you're, and you're saying there's a question about leadership and the quality of management and availability of quality management. There's so many organisations in a small country where you're looking for leadership. Um, it's now not the, is it time not come uh, to actually have a pretty fundamental look at the whole management structure of both health and social care and the relationship between the two. 
As the committee knows, I've raised concerns before in this report and in my recent report on the NHS in Scotland about um, the complexity of the management arrangements and the scope for confusion among the people involved in it. Um, that's an issue raised in this report as well. Um, it clearly is um, a matter for Parliament, Parliament legislated for the creation of the integration authorities um, as an additional layer through there. I think our focus is on um, making sure that that works as well as it can and highlight the pressures that it does throw up and you, you um, referred there specifically to the challenge of getting enough leaders of the right caliber able to do this it's definitely a challenge for the integration authorities themselves and we highlighted the number who either have shared posts or have got very high levels of turnover there's no doubt that's making doing this harder um, I think the committee may be interested in the um, plans that government and COSLA through their joint working group have got for addressing um, some of those challenges and speeding up the, the limited progress we've seen so far. And my final question is, and we've had this recently in Lanarkshire, where one of the chief executives mm -hmm. has been, in my understanding, is um, encouraged to leave. Uh, that's maybe not the official version, but my understanding is there may be another huge payoff here. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of chief executives um, left post in the three years the integration authorities have been up and running. Are you keeping an eye on what payoffs there are? Because I think there's a lot of public money, again, getting wasted on massive payouts that are not a statutory requirement. Yes, as part of the annual audit of all of the bodies that come under my responsibility and that of the Accounts Commission, the IJBs are local government bodies, um, the auditor is required to look at the remuneration report and at significant um, transactions, significant events like the departure of a chief officer. So we, we look at that and for the ones that sit within my responsibility, I'll report them to this committee as appropriate. And ask Sarwar. Um, Mr Neil has got to the, the heart of, I think, the three, three big issues. I just want to follow up on them, which are around budgets, around consistency and around structure. Um, so just firstly, on, on budgets, um, or General, you quite rightly said that there needs to be an increase of an, an investment, um, a subpriming, as, as you said, in, in terms of some of the integrated authorities. Um, how much of a challenge is the fact that health boards are having to make savings uh, and local authorities are having to make savings and are so therefore passing on the need to make those savings to integrate authorities and therefore undermining the plan to have that some pride in that investment and integration. I'll ask Lee in a moment to come in and answer your specific question. Um, I'll kick off, though, by just clarifying that I said at the moment we don't know what additional funding may be required, but we have identified that the significant changes we've seen so far have often relied on additional funding. That's why the longer-term financial planning matters. Lee, can you talk about the financial pressures facing the bodies involved? Uh, yes, so we've, we've set out in, in terms of the uh, level of savings that um, the integration authorities will, will need to make. Um, I think... Um, and in our uh, recent report uh, on the NHS, we also talked about the levels of saving um, that the NHS boards are having to make as well. But I think we see uh, changing the models of care as a way of trying to uh, make the system more sustainable because the current way of delivering um, health and care is not sustainable because of the financial pressures and the rising demand. Um, and we see that some of the uh, new ways of delivering care that we're starting to see emerge are a way to try and uh, ensure sustainability going forward. And, and speaking to local authority individuals and, and people that sit on the integrated authorities, you do get a sense that at times they feel as if the health boards and the local authorities are passing on some of the hard decisions or the savings and the cuts that they would have to make to the IJB because in some ways it's easier to pass the, the, the cut and the, the bad bad press to them. How, how much are you seeing that from, from your interaction with the integrated authorities? Um, I, they, each um, integration authority has a, a, a scheme of uh, an integration scheme, if you like, where they agree um, how the finances will work. So each, you know, in, in setting that up, they have already uh, agreed um, how the, the the savings will be made and the proportion that will be uh, submitted. And if um, the integration authorities are struggling um, to uh, break even at the end of the year, how that will. Um, uh, it be divided up between the partners, and I think we outline that in our report. Um, so there is an agreement there, but yes, the, it, there's tough, tough decisions to be made all round in terms of um, service provision going forward. 
And, and would it be a fair assessment to say that the budgetary pressures on local authorities and the NHS makes it harder to achieve the integration that we all want to achieve? Yes, and I think we say that in our report, that the financial pressures are making it more difficult to achieve the scale and pace of change um, that we would like to see. Thank you. And just on the consistency, again, there seems to be a, a challenge with the 31 local authorities. There doesn't seem to be an agreed model of what the responsibilities and the areas for each IJB is, and there seems to be an inconsistency across the 31 um, integrated authorities. How much consistency or how much need for consistency do you think we need or how much should we leave it to the flexibility of individual integrated authorities? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think the legislation was deliberately designed um, to give people flexibility at a local level um, and we all recognise that there can be good reasons for that. Um, Glasgow looks very different from Highland, looks very different from the island health boards and, and councils. Um, I think our concern is that that flexibility um, is not leading to a consistent pace of change that is <coughs> tailored to the local circumstances, but instead is leading to confusion and disagreement about what the arrangements ought to be. Um, and that's why I think we've reached the stage of saying that a stronger steer is needed from government and that the government, because the working group task force looking at this is a, an important vehicle for making that happen. Happen. And what do you propose that, that looks like, Auditor General? Do you think there should be a, a set framework of this is the basics of what an integrated authority should do and the options of what the add-ons can be? Just set a little bit about what you think the solution might be. I think in terms of the outcomes for people, it's probably important to be clearer um, which services ought to be involved um, in the integration authority and what the outcomes are that the integration authorities are working towards. One of the things we highlight in the report is the very wide range of um, outcomes and indicators that apply to them, which make it hard to see what the priorities are. Um, beyond that, we think there are ways of working which can um, improve the, their effectiveness. And Lee, I think, will want to say a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm just reflecting on our recent children and young people's mental health report, for example, I think we don't understand enough yet, we don't have enough evidence yet about uh, which services should be delegated and, and, and which shouldn't. There is a minimum um, that I, uh, the integration authorities are uh, responsible for, but um, in the children and young people's mental health audit, for example, we did uh, try and look at whether... Uh, children's services being delegated uh, was more effective um, or the, the outcomes were better, but we couldn't find evidence of that. And of course, the argument some, some um, authorities would have is that um, the children's services should stay in the local authority because it's nearer education, whilst others would argue, uh, particularly in children, mental, young people, mental health, that it should um, sit within the IJB to be closer to the, the health um, services um, that children and young people might need. So I think we need to understand uh, more and understand the outcomes that are being achieved by different uh, services being delegated. So, so, so we've already heard um, and outlined in the report about the, the challenge around, around the budgets and the impact that's having on, on integration, the challenges around consistency, given there's that many um, integrated authorities uh, working in partnership with local authorities and, and NHS boards. That brings it on to, I think that's connected to the structure. Um, surely we are management and bureaucracy heavy in terms of value for money, in terms of the high salary roles that we have around the 22 uh, health boards, the 31 integrated authorities, the 32 local authorities. Uh, how much around integrating perhaps the posts, if not aligning the structures, uh, is one area to look at around trying to re reduce some of the bureaucracy costs? And is there a time now to try and look at reducing the number of different bodies there are to try and get greater consistency, greater value for money and drive the money and, and investment towards actual service delivery rather than salaries and management posts. I think there's a, a bit of a paradox in here. Um, I think it's easy to castigate management as being something which is different from providing health and care services. I don't think it is. I think good management is essential to being able to plan, deliver um, and transform services in the way that we need. Um, I have said in, in this report and in previous reports, though, that not only do we have more bodies now involved in this particular area as well as others, it's not always clear to us or, more importantly, to the people involved what the different roles and responsibilities are. We say in this report that some people who sit on IJBs don't understand, for example, what the new regional responsibilities for workforce planning look like. Um, we are seeing increasing responsibilities for planning acute care and for delivering some specialist acute care at a regional level. It's not clear to everyone involved how all of that joins up. 
And that means that what ought to be an investment in senior managers and leaders who can work with staff and people to change things ends up being spent on negotiating and disagreeing about about what actually they're there to do. That's the problem. And, and, fin and final question. In, in the report, you also make clear around governance and around leadership. Surely a more streamlined governance and leadership structure can help provide stronger management and provide a, a better consistency across the country. Um, is that an area that the um, Audit Scotland will be looking at around how we can streamline our leadership and governance structures in order to deliver that? Well, that's clear to pick that question up. Yeah, there's no doubt that that's something that came through in this piece of work very strongly when we spoke to everybody involved in the system that they had struggled with the accountability and governance arrangements, still are struggling in many areas. Um, we've got some examples in the report of um, Aberdeen City particularly who got support from the Good Governance Institute to help to think through things like risk management um, and how that would apply across all of the bodies involved. It is incredibly complicated. Um, that said, the change that they're trying to affect is complicated. That will take time. Um, there's something also about bringing together um, the two cultures of local authorities and health, people needing to understand how each other works um, in, bro in a broad sense, but also in some of the technical issues around things like the finances. Um, so that work is, is happening, but there's something we highlighted as a risk in our report back in 2015. You'll see in Appendix 3 some of those issues that we identified in that initial report. While there have been some examples of progress, actually there's, there still are some of those risks um, that re are reflected in this report today. Can I add a tiny supplementary? Given that we now have 31 local integrated authorities, do we need 22 health boards? So that is a question for government uh, rather than for us. Um, I think what we've set out in this report is the difficulty in bringing together those various roles and responsibilities. Uh, there's no doubt that the environment that the IJBs are operating in is incredibly complicated in terms of some of those financial challenges. We've absolutely asked questions about the clarity and understanding of that regional, national and very local model. And it's clear that that still is not fitting together very clearly. People are struggling to understand their way through that came through loud and clear for this report. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. I, I think Anna's line is very interesting, so I'll develop that if I may. Before I do, I'm going to put a very blunt question to Lee Johnson, if I may. Uh, you talked about effectiveness. Uh, now, looking through this report, there, there are some statistics on effectiveness. Uh, but the statistics don't seem to show marked improvement, if I may put it that way. Uh, and so my question to you is simply this. Couldn't those statistics, the, the improvements, be down to chance uh, or be down to something the health board is doing, something the council is doing, rather than directly attributable to the new setup? Uh, and if that is possible, then aren't we diverting £400 million a year from the health budget into something that isn't markedly making an improvement? Um, I, I, we can't, there's no suggestion of causation there. Um, but I think um, we are, as we in, later in the report uh, lay out, we are starting to see uh, improvements at a local uh, level. Um, so yes, they are, you know, the, the, the improvements are not marked and that's what we say, that we need uh, better data. And as we've said several times recently at the committee around the NHS, we need better data um, and monitoring um, and more openness and transparency about the difference that is happening and the impact that integration is having. Um, I don't think at a national level we have a clear enough picture of that yet, um, but I think having reviewed all of the local performance reports, we are starting to see um, improvements um, at a local level that are directly attributable to um, it, it integrated initiatives and, and um, you know, projects and, and different ways of delivering services. Okay, thank you. Uh, you talked, the panel talked uh, about leadership uh, and governance and things to uh, Mr. Sarwar, uh, and the report certainly talks concerningly about some aspects of that. Uh, so I see that you talk about part-time chief financial officers and some of the financial officers having dual roles in particular, uh, or can't be recruited. 
Uh, and, and certainly that was th th this whole idea of corporate infrastructure was something that, looking through, I wasn't quite convinced of. Uh, you also talk about a lack of support services, so HR, for example. Uh, so that being what it is, is this something where, for example, the Scottish Government needs to be stepping in and giving a much clearer steer about this is what the model needs to look like, uh, these are the sorts of staff uh, you should have, and this is how it's supposed to run? I think my sense is probably um, less that there is a template for what staffing model you need to have and, and how the support services work, and instead a clearer um, focus by government and councillor, given this is a joint initiative with local government, um, to be uh, clear about what progress they should be making and a willingness to step in where that progress isn't happening for whatever reason, whether it's a lack of capacity, a lack of people doing the key jobs, whether it's a disagreement about the set-aside budget, um, whether it's um, a need to find some pump-priming money to invest to get from the current service model to a new one. Um, I think we all recognise the importance of respecting local difference. There's no question that matters. But for a policy this big and important, where the progress is as slow as it has been so far, I think it's, it's not feasible anymore to maintain that hands-off approach and not be willing to step in um, and make changes, require changes, where progress is not happening and people are stuck. A, a, a brief point that arises from that, which I, I, I'm not clear in my own mind, we've looked as a committee several times it's the uh, difficulties in recruiting at the top level uh, just because th th there will always be um, finding talent will always be difficult finding experience uh, are these the same people uh, that that are looking after the IGBs that are doing these dual roles as for example in the health boards They've almost all, I think, come from within a health board or a council, and it varies in different parts of Scotland. I'm just looking to see if either Claire or Lee want to add to that. Um, not, not so much. I think that that's absolutely right, that the, the dual role issue is within the system as a whole. So that's the pool that is being drawn from. I think what we've tried to do in this report is set out quite clearly the different leadership ask, if you like, within that integration brings. So what it's looking for are leaders that are working in a much more collaborative way. Um, when we think about the role of the chief officer, often that is flexing to a degree in terms of negotiation around change, um, trying to get consensus across a range of partners. So you're seeing a very different leadership style, you could argue, than traditionally has been the case across the health system, for example, for a while. Um, and I think there's a message in here as well that the current system is not working. There's general consensus of the need for change. Um, I think we were very interested um, from an audit perspective about issues to do with power um, and how that was being reflected in the role of those chief officers. Um, this can only work if all parties are signed up to it and engaged with it, so big implications for everybody involved. Um, and thinking about leadership is absolutely key in that. Well, that's really interesting, Claire Sweeney, because you, you talked earlier about uh, the Aberdeen example, and certainly the report seems favourably predisposed to uh, what's happening in Aberdeen. So what is it about Aberdeen? Did, did they, you've talked in there about cultural differences. Uh, are those have, have somehow the leaders presumably managed to get rid of those cultural differences uh, or are they working around them? And if in any event, how is that knowledge going to be shared? So I think it's fair to say that actually not one area in Scotland has got all of this right. That's why there are such a range of examples within the report, um, particularly thinking about things like the um, scenario planning example on page 28 from, from Shetland. Because that's about getting to the heart of having the difficult discussions. We were warned quite early on to be very cautious about partnerships that seemed very quiet where there was not a lot of disagreement because that suggested things weren't being tackled. Um, so one area hasn't got it cracked. There's absolutely something interesting in Aberdeen City around their focus on governance, um, getting support from people who are well informed around governance to help facilitate that conversation. What are the tricky issues and how do we need to resolve this locally? So there is something quite interesting in that model. Um, what I would also say though is that change in leadership message um, and we highlight in the report the changes at that senior level that they've been since integration was introduced brings a degree of um, fragility to some of those examples in the report. Um, so where we see things working well in some areas and I'm very thoughtful about the examples of the third 
third sector starting to make improvements, um, it can quite quickly change, um, and that has been ex our experience over a number of years, uh, where we see pockets of small examples of things working well, that can change very quickly if leaders change, or if funding is not there, or if the pressures increase. Um, so, so lots of good examples in the report, but tend to be very small scale. Mm -hmm. Auditor General? Mr Chair, I was just going to add that one of the things the Scottish Government COSLA group is focusing on is uh, training and developing leaders to do this. We've highlighted in our report the things that um, leaders involved in this need to do. That's not just the leaders of the integration authorities, but also those in the health board and the council, and, and getting that developed will take time. You asked at the end of your question about sharing good practice, and that seems to us the other critical thing that needs um, a real boost now. We've, we found some examples of things working well. Some of those are fragile, and we need to use things like the approach that the NHS has taken to the patient safety programme to really learn from those and spread that experience much more widely in a way that respects the fact that different places are different, but is also very clear about what is expected of people in terms of the change that they're making. Uh, on that point, if I may, Auditor General, the, uh, you referred to a group that's co-chaired by COSLA and Scottish Government. I think this is the one uh, you talk about, paragraph 35. Uh, and my understanding is that that's looking at how to uh, overcome barriers to integration. Uh, so have they produced anything substantive? If not, or indeed if so, but when uh, will this be out? And uh, when can all of these bodies start looking at something substantive to say this is how we need to change? I think what they have produced, which is positive, is a statement which acknowledges that, that um, change needs to happen much more quickly, that the pace of change isn't sufficient, and we've highlighted some areas they're working on. I think Claire may be able to tell you more about the, the uh, process they're going through to do that. And the group uh, will conclude its work in January 2019, um, so we're following that quite closely, we want to keep in regular contact with the group. And in essence, what that has been has been drawn together all leaders across health, local authorities and um, the integration authorities to start to think through what are the difficult questions that we need to tackle at this point and start to see if there is a need for things like more guidance, more direction, and also facilitating that um, training and support that the Auditor General mentioned to make sure that the leaders are, are in the state they need to be in to tackle this agenda, as much as thinking about the capacity that's around them to support them. Thank you. Phil Bowman. Thank you, convener. Um, you, you mentioned already, I think, Appendix 3, and uh, that there's perhaps been not so much progress. In fact, the heading progress is perhaps not the correct term for that, for that column. But without going through the specifics, in terms of um, you've got the Scottish Government and integration authorities. Now, I remember when Paul Gray was here at one point, he told us that in respect of the NHS, the buck stopped with him or his role. In terms of the headings here, Scottish Government and integration authorities, where does the buck stop for these two um, organisations, shall we say? Um, the integration authorities themselves, or the integration joint boards, are local government bodies and are established as such in the legislation that um, Parliament passed. Um, that means they're formally accountable to their electorates in the same way that councils are. Um, government is obviously accountable for the success of the policy overall of integrating and meeting the needs of, of people right across Scotland. Um, one of the things we have heard a lot in doing this work is that the accountability arrangements aren't clear. I think actually that's not true. I think if you, if you keep it simple and high level, they are clear. Um, what gets in the way is people's agreement about their individual integration schemes and the ways in which the health boards, councils and integration authorities work together. And again, I think there's a a real need for government and COSLA to make sure that all of those are clarified and that people are living up to them in providing the services they're responsible for. So in terms of when you go through your procedures to finalise the report, you get the fact checking, who do you give it to then? Um, this report, most of the fact checking is with the factual accuracy confirmation is with government itself. Um, and then where there are um, mentions of individual integration authorities, we pass that section to them for their comments government itself there's a particular person responsible the director general for health and social care is the accountable officer for, for the, the scottish government yeah. but in the terms of the integration authorities there's, there's a single person responsible single. as not for as not for local government as a whole yeah. okay thank you okay willie coffee thanks very much <coughs> conveners just to continue the the theme of the the discussion um if you look at appendix four auditor general you see a picture there it's, it's about financial performance but 
if you were to choose a word to describe that, it wouldn't be integration. <laughs> it's a, a really mixed picture right across all the authorities that are part of the IGBs and so on and so forth. And members have, have raised this issue about how well they are or are not integrating. Um, has, has COSLA themselves responded to your report so far? And what kind of message are we getting from there, firstly? Um, I, th I think COSLA um, have responded um, to the report, sort of welcoming the overall findings and the, the push for further change. Um, I think we know that COSLA are committed to the policy um, from their involvement in the group with a, which they co-chair with government to um, push this forward, which has issued a statement acknowledging that the pace of change needs to increase. Um, and I think in some ways they're facing the mirror of the challenge the government does, that there are 32 councils out there, 31 integration authorities, and a lot of people and services that need to change. My view is that getting a grip on that for both COSLA and government is now the priority. I mean, even the IJBs themselves report on their own performance. Is it an IJB authority or do they report the separate performance of the council components of that? The, the IJBs that? do produce their own report, and I think Lee can tell you a bit yeah, more about the way they look. compounded in terms of, for example, take Ayrshire. Yeah. Ayrshire now, there's three councils in there. If the IJB is reporting in its performance, does it, does it report by authority within that? It would, each IGB would produce their own performance report and there is um, a, a range of uh, core indicators that every um, integration authority will report against um, within their, their performance reports. Um, so yes, each individual authority would have a, a, a performance report. Within themselves that we are the greatest area for, for work has to be carried out or, and so on. What I'm trying to get is if what, I'm not get, picking out any one of the authorities in particular, but say one of them was a wee bit behind the curve, are they aware of that? And are they, are they doing anything about that collectively to tackle that? I think the, the, you know, there are, uh, as I said, core indicators that they will be working towards, um, reflected in things like um, admissions to hospital, delayed discharge, you know, along the lines of some of the um, national indicators. So they will have a, an idea of whether they're um, reducing um, some of those, those numbers, if you like. But I think what we, and what we say in the report is we don't have a good uh, national picture of um, performance and, and impact um, from the different areas. I can maybe short circuit that a bit by pointing you towards Exhibit 4 in the report. It's a double page spread which sets out the national performance framework, nine national health and wellbeing outcomes, 12 principles in the Act, six national indicators, and then a range of local priorities, performance indicators, and outcomes. Um, integration authorities are reporting against those, which makes it quite quite difficult to get either a clear picture of an individual integration authority's performance or to make the sorts of comparisons that I think you're trying to get at. It's not that there's a dearth of information or data, it's that there's a lack of that clear picture of where they are and where they're planning to get to. Yeah. Something that the discussion we're having, you could almost have heard this in another area at another time in this committee. When we talk about issues about leadership, financial planning, strategic planning, governance, sharing good practice. We've kind of heard these messages in a number of areas and we kind of all agree that they need, we need to do something about them and the participants to deliver this, they all agree, but how on earth do we move at that next stage forward and get it done? Who, who, who are the leaders that must get this done? Should the government dictate and, and set new guidelines and requirements? Should COSLA be a bit more firm and what's the key to succeeding with this? And again, if we're sitting here in a year's time with a follow-up report, how on earth are we going to get any comfort that we're going to get closer towards that? Um, I share the committee's frustration on that. It's um, obviously both a very important area of policy um, and, as you say, some common features. Um, what we've tried to do in the report is to be as clear as we can that government and COSLID now need to build on the foundations that are in place. They're just foundations, but they, they do provide a basis for going forward. We set out in Exhibit 7 the features that we've identified that support integration. They're 
things which I think are quite simple, although that doesn't mean they're easy, around collaborative leadership, integrating your financial planning, having a real focus on what are the outcomes you want to achieve, being able to monitor that, involving people in the process. And now it's about using the same consistent and rigorous approach that the government has used to things like the patient safety programme to get behind that and make sure that their efforts and the efforts across the health and care system are really pushing in the same direction towards that. Just to, one of your predecessors in this committee, George Fuchs, used to say, what next? Right, what next? This is a, it's a really, really good report and it gives everybody a clear information about what the direction of travel should be. But if we're, how, how are we going to assess and see that progress has been made rather than waiting for your report to come next year and, and, and give us some indication that there's been slow progress. How do we monitor it as we go to make sure that the things that need to be done are being done as we go along? How does that process happen? Claire Sweeney mentioned a moment ago that the government cost of the group is due to report by the end of January. I think at that stage the committee might want to look at the report that they produce and perhaps take evidence on it from them to see how they're planning to address some of the barriers here um, and deal with the things that we think would make a difference. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Auditor General, I mean, I, I, think that, I think we all agree this report is really messy landscape across uh, Scotland. I remember um, at the start of the last parliament, the cabinet secretary at the time saying that they had to leave um, sufficient room in the legislation for local bodies, NHS boards and local authorities to make their own plans. But that seems like a, a really messy picture now where you've got areas of strength, some places. I mean, having a close look at the report, there are some examples here um, of, I think Claire Sweeney said, um, small examples of good practice. Some of this actually predates the legislation. The, the, I, I might be wrong in this, but the, exam, the small example from Dundee on social prescribing, I'm sure predates uh, the legislation on integration. So... Is it possible to, to give, you know, how much progress has actually been made since the Act itself? Because we do know that integration was happening um, on an informal basis before we voted on it in Parliament. I think, I mean, this is a question we've considered amongst ourselves and the wider team a lot. Is the legislation, is integration making a difference? And I think the conclusion we've come to after lots of grappling with the evidence is that it can make a difference. And it is in some places, on some aspects of what's needed, really starting to, to um, unpick some of the, the barriers that have been getting in the way of change for a long time. But that it isn't enough to say, let a thousand flowers bloom and people will sort of magically work together at a local level and make the change that's required. We know there are good reasons why this is tough. Um, people are very focused on delivering what started off as their day jobs. I think in, in future this is the day job, but running hospitals and running social care and primary care is where most people started. The budget still comes through the separate organisations. It needs a real push to move away from the, the sort of momentum and the inertia of the way things have been in the past to doing this differently. I think we're encouraged by some of the good practice we have seen, and it's not all in the report. And we think that more is needed now to really move that forward. It's not going to happen just as a natural process of rolling out. The government and COSLA group is a, an important step forward, but in a sense it's a really important opportunity that can't be missed to take that commitment and goodwill and move on from here um, to, uh, um, to release some of the pressures we're seeing on the separate running of the NHS and of social care. I mean, you're saying it's three years now. Do you think there would be a case to be made that if we don't see progress at a local level, that we need to make the legislation more detailed and, and be more specific about about how these bodies should run? In a sense, I think there would be no alternative but for Parliament to have another look at the legislation if it doesn't start to change clearly within the next 18 months or so, um, simply because the pressures on the NHS and on social care are increasing so fast. OK. Can I ask, um, we've looked at governance around several health boards around Scotland, and clearly the financial officers have a key role to play here. But I note from your report at paragraph 36 that... Um, only half of IJBs have a full-time chief financial officer and there have been difficulties in filling those posts in some areas. Now, as I understand it, um, some will have full-time, some will have part-time that they're doing a job either in the council or in the health board. Have you 
Is it better practice that they have a full-time CFO, considering they're responsible for so much money? So it speaks to the broader point about um, the capacity around the IGBs to make a difference. Um, given the challenge facing them, um, we've raised here that actually there are a number of them that don't have that full-time capacity in place. And we would have a question as to the ability to make progress on a significant area like this, unless there is a really good finance, HR, data support around the, the IAs. They're very they're small, they're very small. Um, so it's key that all players are supportive of that agenda. So yes, that's one example of an area that we think needs to be needs to be looked at. It would be better if the integration boards had a full time chief officer and a full time chief financial officer. I think that would there's certainly enough work for the integration mm. authorities to be doing if they are going to fulfil their responsibilities. We say in paragraph 37 that, that one of the challenges is that if they don't have that capacity, they're very reliant on the information that's provided by the health board um, and the council. And that makes it harder for them, for example, to really come to an understanding of what the set-aside budget ought to be and to take on responsibility for managing it, which in turn makes it more difficult to avoid emergency admissions to hospital or to get people out of hospital more quickly. It, it's that ability to really make sense of the services that they're responsible for and to start to move away from the way we've always done things to something which is about where we want to get to. How about the chief officers themselves? Are they all full-time? They are. Because I note that your report says that in 1718 we spent £3 million on chief officers' pay, but there's not a lot of progress to show for it. Would that be a fair summary? So we, the areas that are making more progress are those that are demonstrating um, that they've moved forward on those areas where we identified at the start of part two of the report. Uh, so there are some areas that are making more progress than others. Uh, one of the issues that came through um, quite strongly to us um, very early in looking at this whole policy area was a sense that some areas thought this wasn't going to happen, um, that the existing systems could just kind of continue as they are, and that there would be some sort of small pocket of integration at some point where the services intersected. Um, I think what we've seen over the last year is a, a sort of stepping up of the commitment to, in, to integration happening. And you could argue that some areas that are not addressing those issues we've set out in part two, and where they didn't think this was actually real change that was going to happen at a, a system-wide level, they are playing catch up and they're further behind. So I think there are a whole range of issues captured there. We're not seeing it working ideally in any one area across Scotland. Uh, but there are some lessons to be learned and hopefully that comes through quite strongly, particularly in part two of the report. Okay. Exhibit five gives national performance against six areas such as bed days. Um, is it possible that the committee can have this information broken down by local authority? We tried to include um, local variation where we could so we can supply the committee with the information we were able to get for this. I would say these six indicators are those that the Ministerial Steering Group used to keep a focus on whether integration is delivering or not. Uh, we found it very, very difficult to get agreement um, around some of the data for this particular exhibit. Um, so we can, we can share a more full picture, but we weren't able to break that down um, to local areas for all of those indicators. Lee Johnson, you're laughing. You obviously had difficulty uh, <laughs> we, we getting did. local um, information. Why was that? I think it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a difference in the way that uh, centrally they collate um, and the methodology they use compared to what uh, some of the localities recognise. And I think it just um, is a reflection of that difficulty of understanding at a national level um, the impact um, and progress, because there's such a number of indicators. Um, but yes, it was challenging. Perhaps that's something that would need to be addressed in the legislation if Parliament was minded to, to look at this again. Do members have any... Yes, Liam Kerr. Briefly, uh, can you just explain something to me for my own understanding? Um, how does the council funding piece work? Because the council's put in 2.4 billion, I think, last year. Now, that comes out of the council budget. There are constrained times for council budgets. So is that fully funded by government or are they instructed, look, carve it out from your current budget and put 2.4 billion over the piece? into the IJBs. And in any event, isn't there a danger 
that councils, by virtue of having to fund this area, are going to have to cut services elsewhere, which perhaps have been mirrored? Uh, lots in that question. Um, that's all right. We'll do our best to answer it, and the, keep, the team will keep me straight. Um, for The intention is that for both councils and for the NHS, that they will, together with the integration authority, identify how much is spent on community health services, uh, primary health services, unplanned hospital services, um, and social care services for the affected, for the, the people, older people in all places, children in some, who are in, included in the integration scheme, and they will then pull their budgets to do that. So it's coming from their core budgets. There has been some additional funding from government, 250 million, I think, in 1617, and that plus a, an addition in 1718, which went to NHS boards and then had to be passed on to the integration authorities to fund some of the the um, services that are involved here, and both the councils and the health boards are required to make efficiency savings in different ways, reflecting the overall pressure on public finances and, and the intention they should be improving the way they use money. So it's coming from their core budgets with, with savings coming out of that and some additional funding. Um, that complexity is part of the reason why a number of integration authorities have found it difficult to agree their budgets. There are timing differences as well. Um, and as you say, if that money is coming into the integration authority, the pressures which we recognise are affecting other council services and other parts of the NHS budget become hard, harder to manage. All of that is why this is complicated. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was more in your question as well, so I'll pause there and let the team come in. Just to add that... Um We've tried to set out in the report. It's quite complicated to get a very clear picture of IJB um, finances. Um, we set out at Appendix 12 that a number of them needed to call on additional resources than were initially planned from the council and from the NHS board. The way the legislation set up the um, IJBs specifically was that locally they could agree who would carry the risk. So again, we've tried to explain that in the report, that that's very different in different local areas. So if there's an overspend, say, on the social work services that the IJBs are directing, the way that that resource comes from the partner bodies when there's an issue is very different locally. So some of that has been worked through. And again, we've tried to set that out um, on page 12 of the report. Thank you. Any further points or questions from members? OK. Can I thank Officer General and our team very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of this meeting. Thank you.